Hello, hello, and welcome back to Topic 3 on Power Series in AP Calculus BC. Um, this is actually our second to last lesson. Um, this lesson focuses on differentiation and integration of power series. And it's a kind of cool one. It really brings everything full circle. And we've spent most of this semester learning about infinite series, and we've done very little integration and differentiation. Um, so it should make sense then that we circle back and see how this relates to derivatives and integrals. Uh, so a quick warm-up for you, speaking of integrals. Um, please go ahead and without a calculator, find the antiderivative of each function below. And you can check it by taking the derivative and making sure you get the right answer, yeah? Ready, set, go. So you're back quickly. Uh, my guess is you might have struggled a bit on these. Now, you should be able to do the first one. The first one, if you ignore the non-dominant terms, we get 1 over x, which to me is natural log. Um, so remembering a few things about natural log. First, antiderivative always must include absolute value put a 1 here. Um, and second, we should probably check that, right? If I took the derivative of the natural log of 1 over x, it would be 1 over what's inside times the derivative of what's inside. That's an extra negative 1 that isn't there. So something must have canceled out that negative 1, so we do need an extra negative out front. And then we're almost done, but oh, we can't forget the big rule of antiderivatives, the plus c. Yes, that still exists. We, this is an indefinite integral. We don't have endpoints. We do still need the plus c. So there's that derivative. Nothing too terrible. Now, this second one is a bit harder. I see some students say, oh, the antiderivative of natural log, that's 1 over x. No, that's the derivative of natural log. Um, I'm not actually quite sure how to do that one. Okay, so let's skip that. Let's go here. And you're like, ooh, antiderivative e to the x squared. You're like, that's easy because e to the x squared is always itself. Um, but then you check the derivative, and you're like, but the derivative of that has an extra 2x. We need to cancel out the 2x. Okay, cool. So can we just divide off the 2x? But then when you take the derivative, now you have to use the quotient rule, and the quotient rule won't match. Ugh, that is just getting ugly. Okay, so what do we do? Well, the answer is um, with derivatives, it's pretty easy to take the derivative of pretty much every function. Integration, though, becomes much more challenging. And we're actually only able to find the antiderivative of a small subset of functions. Now, I wanted to show you these two antiderivatives really quickly just using um, my CAS calculator. And you can find free CAS calculators online too if you want, or if your calculator says CAS at the top, it'll actually find you these indefinite integrals, and it's good practice for you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up this guy and also make that go away. There we go. Here's my calculator, just in the calculate screen, and we're going to do menu, calculus, integral. Now it does give spaces for the lower and upper limits of integration, but notice how they're grayed out. That means they're optional. So I'm just going to go here, natural log of x dx, and there is an antiderivative of natural log of x. It's x times the ln of x minus x. So to take the derivative, you'd use the product rule here and get an answer, and then it'll end with a minus 1 at the end, and everything will cancel out and give you natural log, which is very exciting, but um, my guess is you probably would not have figured that out without a calculator. But you're like, okay, fair. I mean, there is something, nothing too bad. Well, what about the other one? Menu, calculus, integral, and the other one was e to the x squared dx. Oops, it just rewrote it. And that's because this is outside of the capacity of the calculator to calculate. So it doesn't know what this antiderivative is. So does that mean it's beyond our capacity too? And the answer is no, actually. By the end of today, you, if you choose to accept it, will be able to find that antiderivative. You'll be better than a calculator. So let's jump to it. Okay, we are able to take, and I already said that, sorry. Um, so let's look back at the first problem on the opener. We found the antiderivative was negative, natural log, absolute value, 1 minus x plus c. Now, interesting things are going to happen when we compare the two Maclaurin series. So we're going to create first the Maclaurin series of 1 over 1 minus x, which is easy because we have it memorized. Um, and then we're going to do the other one for this guy, which we don't have memorized. You're going to have to build this one from scratch. And you might want to use some of the room over here to build it from scratch. So let's see what we can do. So the Maclaurin series for 1 over 1 minus x is not bad. right? We know that's just going to be our, it's our geometric series, right? It looks like this. Uh, cubed plus x to the n. Cool. 
I'll kind of group that off. Now, if I want the Maclaurin series for this guy, I'm going to start space here, and maybe I'll finish it over here. Um, we're going to have to go way back to our, you know, our favorite definition of a series, which is f of 0 over 0 factorial, x minus 0 to the 0th, right? We have to remember this guy, too, because although we memorize some series, that's only four of them, and so we do need to be able to derive the rest of these. Remember, we're looking for that trifecta, prime 1, 1, okay? And we have our second derivative, and hopefully that'll be enough to figure out the pattern. Let's begin. f of x is the negative natural log of 1 minus x, right? Nothing bad. Um, and then f of 0 becomes negative natural log 1 minus 0 is 1, but any log of 1 is 0. Cool. Next one. f prime of x we know what the derivative of this is, it's 1 over 1 minus x, we found that before. Um, you might want to rewrite it as 1 minus x to the negative first, and then we need f of 0, that becomes 1 over 1 minus 0, which is 1. Then we need f double prime of x, okay? um, f double prime of x, I'm going to use this one to take the derivative this time, so this one becomes negative 1, 1 minus x to the negative second, sorry, I'll zoom in, times the derivative of the inside, which is an extra negative 1, turning this into positive 1, times 1 minus x to the negative second, or if you want, 1 over 1 minus x squared. And doing a little mental math, f of 0 is again going to be 1. We have space, let's go two more derivatives just in case we need them, I have a feeling we might. Third derivative, we'll use this guy, so we end up with negative 2 times 1 minus x to the negative third times an extra negative 1, which really just turns this to a positive again. Um, so that's going to give us um, 2 over 1 minus x cubed, which means that f triple prime of 0 becomes 2 over 1, which is 2. Last but not least, the fourth derivative negative 3 times 2 is negative 6 times 1 minus x to the negative 4th times a negative 1, which makes this a positive, 6 over 1 minus x to the 4th. So the fourth derivative of 0 is 6 over 1, which is 6. Start to recognize these. These are factorials, aren't they? 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial. That's probably enough to establish a pattern. Let's maybe even rewrite these as their factorials. Okay, I think that might help us cancel a few things here. It's supposed to be green, but that's okay. All right, so jumping down here, I'll continue, and I'm going to say that my power series then for negative ln of 1 minus x is, and let's see, f of 0 is 0. That's this guy over here. So this whole first term just becomes 0. Okay, my next one, f prime of 0 we have 0 factorial over 1 factorial, 1 over 1, that's just 1x, if you will. And then my next one, f double prime of 0, takes 1 factorial, puts it over 2 factorial, that's just going to be 1 half x squared, squared. Okay, what about my next one? Um, and hopefully you can envision it's f triple prime of 0 over 3 factorial. And remember, if you put 2 factorial over 3 factorial, we get 2 times 1 on top and 3 times 2 times 1 on the bottom. So it's really just going to leave, if you have a factorial that's 1 smaller in the top than the denominator, it really is just going to cancel everything except the number down there. So that's going to give us 1 third x cubed. Can we see the pattern now? 1 half x squared, 1 third x cubed. For this last one, for the fourth derivative, you're going to have 3 factorial over 4 factorial which will reduce to 1 fourth, so 1 quarter, x to the fourth, and so on and so forth. And I'll go ahead and box this guy down here too. So we have our Maclaurin series for the negative natural log of 1 minus x and for 1 over 1 minus x. Now what? How do the two series compare to each other? And why is that not a surprise? What do you mean compare to each other? Well, looking at these, um, I start to recognize this pattern, actually, the 1 half x squared, 1 third x cubed. What would happen if you were to take the derivative of every term here? If I said, I want you to find d dx of this guy, right, and then we follow it all the way out. Well, 
1 x becomes 1, 1 half x squared becomes x, 1 third x cubed becomes x squared, 1 quarter x to the fourth becomes x cubed. Oh, look at that. The derivative of my power series became the other power series. And why is that not surprising? Well, this was the power series for 1 over 1 minus x, and isn't the derivative of natural log of 1 minus x 1 over 1 minus x? And so what this is telling us then is if the derivative of the function equals the other guy, then the derivative of the power series also equals the other power series. And so this is actually magnificent because what we're going to be able to learn below is that we are able to integrate or differentiate functions in a new way. Instead of taking the derivative or the integral of a function's equation, you can actually take the derivative or integrate a power series. Now, the power series has an infinite number of terms, so we integrate this, what's known as term by term. We integrate one term at a time or differentiate one term at a time. And once you do that, though, it is equivalent to integrating the original function. Now, why is this useful? Well, what if you get a power series, or rather, what if you get a function where you don't know the derivative? Have we seen something like that? Or we don't know the integral, rather. We didn't know the integrals of these two. But could you write, especially this last one, could you write this as a power series? Of course you could. You know e to the x, and then you just substitute in x squared, and bam, you have a power series. And power series are incredibly easy to integrate because power series are just polynomials. They're just a list of terms. And it's very easy to integrate or differentiate a list of terms. You only run into trouble when you have extra pieces like that natural log e to the x squared, function multiplying. And so if you're able to express a function as a power series, bam, you can integrate that function. So let's state this a little more mathematically. Given that a power series converges, and it does have to converge, on some interval, so it's centered at a, radius of r, and defines a function on that interval, then f is differentiable, so and, f is differentiable for a given radius, so we have a function that's differentiable, you can take the derivative, and you can find f prime by differentiating, then what that means is f of x equaling to one power series, f prime is equal to the derivative of that power series. Notice we brought the n down, that's over here, and then reduced the power by one. Of course, we could also go backwards, which means that if you had f of x and you wanted to find capital F of x, or the integral of f of x, then you do the antiderivative of this guy, where you add one to the power, have something to offset it, oh yeah, and don't forget that plus c, it is still there. Now, the radius of convergence does stay the same between derivatives and antiderivatives. However, the inclusion of the endpoints changes. So, for example, if you have some function where you have your interval of convergence from negative 1 and it includes 2, when you take the derivative, the interval is still between negative 1 and 2, but you have to recheck both of the endpoints because sometimes they will work and sometimes they won't. They don't always match the original function. Let's do some practice problems. Find the Maclaurin series for inverse tangent of x. Well, at first glance, that might seem obnoxious, because that's not one that we've memorized. But then we start to think about that. And although I'm not quite sure what the integral of inverse tangent is, doesn't that have a really nice derivative? The derivative of inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And in fact, can't we rewrite that derivative as 1 over 1 minus negative x squared? Which really seems to me, if we started with 1 over 1 minus x and wrote that power series, which we've done a couple times today so far, I'm going to get the general term in here too, and then we substituted negative x squared in, 1, and then we're going to do this all at once, so minus x squared, plus x to the fourth minus x to the sixth plus we now have a negative one little thing going on out here um, and then this becomes x to the two n I think yeah our powers are going up by two and they're alternating in sign sweet this right here represents the derivative of inverse tangent so what we can say then 
is that if this is f of x, then f prime of x, the derivative, is given by the power series that I just wrote up above. Okay, well, this problem, though, asked us to write the Maclaurin series for f of x, for inverse tangent. Well, how do you go from f prime to f? Well, that's easy. We just take the integral of each side. We should probably throw in a dx at the end here and here, right? And so, the antiderivative of f prime is f of x. And the antiderivative of every term here, term by term, antiderivative of 1 is x, minus 1 third x cubed, plus 1 fifth x to the fifth, minus 1 seventh x to the seventh, and so on and so forth. This negative 1 to the n is still going to stay there. You could rewrite the general term based off of this, but you could actually just take the, um, the antiderivative of this here. And to take the antiderivative, we add 1 to the power, and then we offset what we just added to the power. So to offset that, 1 over 2n plus 1. And if you take the derivative, you can quickly check, it'll match up here. If you substitute in 0, you should get the first term, and I think we do, we get x to the first, and 0 in the denominator becomes 1. If we plug in 1, we should get the second term, and you do, and so on and so forth. We just found the power series for inverse tangent without having to do too much. Now, you could have built this from scratch, that same f of 0 over 0 factorial, x minus 0, and so on and so forth, and you'll get there. But I think this is quite a bit faster. And notice it brought everything together that we've done so far. Our geometric series that we had to memorize, our function composition that we learned last class, integration, which we've known for almost a year now, and, of course, power series. Very, very cool, very powerful. Pun intended. Find the Maclaurin series for g of x equals 1 over 1 minus x squared. Hmm. Well, how does that help us? Well, I see that 1 minus x, and we just played around with 1 minus x over here. My guess is that's probably the derivative. So let's take a look. Um, let's say that we had the function 1 over 1 minus x, which is 1 minus x to the negative first. Then if I take the derivative, right, then the derivative becomes negative 1, 1 minus x to the negative second, times an extra negative makes it a positive, so it becomes 1 over 1 minus x squared. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So g of x is actually, I think we can do it like this, right? We can say, um, uh, we can do it like this. We'll say capital G of x is 1 over 1 minus x. And lowercase g is 1 over 1 minus x squared, right? To go from capital to lowercase, you take the derivative. So we have the original and the derivative. How does this help us? Well, if I want to write the power series for this, and I know the power series for the original, we're in business. So let's rock and roll. g of x, once again, easy to work with, right? Plus x to the n. We want to find lowercase g, but lowercase g is just the derivative. So I'm going to take the derivative of every term. What happens here? The n comes down and it becomes x to the n minus 1. And bam, we have the power series for 1 divided by 1 minus x squared. Now, you'll find that these don't come up too often in multiple choice questions because it's fairly tricky to, I mean, imagine if I hadn't been here to guide you, would you have ever considered saying, oh yeah, the derivative of inverse tangent is this, which is just a composition of this, which is really just this. I mean, that's not something I would think of, and the AP exam knows that. So if you see a problem like this on the multiple choice or on free response questions, they're going to be very explicit. They're just going to say, here's a power series, take the derivative, take the integral. But I always like to go a little further and show those applications just so you can say, this is silly, why are we doing extra derivatives? There is a reason. So let's try two free response questions. Maclaurin series for a function, some function is given below. Write the first four non-zero terms of the Maclaurin series for f prime, the derivative of f. Oh, we can do this. Okay, so we know then, and I'm going to write this up above, we know that f of x is equal to x minus 3 halves x squared, just getting this in the problem up above, plus 3x cubed 
Um, I think we need one more term because we want the first four non-zero terms to be a minus. So we probably have to plug in, let's see, so um, looking at this formula, when x is 1, it started at 1, didn't it? When n is 1, rather. So this is 2, 3, we're going to have to do n is 4. So when n is 4, 4 minus 1 over 4 times x to the 4th, okay, this becomes negative 3 to the 3rd over 4 times x to the 4th, negative 27 fourths times x to the 4th. That looks pretty good. So minus 27 fourths x to the 4th, and so on and so forth. Now, notice that they're not asking for the general term, so I'm not even going to write the general term. You can if you want, um, but if they're not asking for it, don't do the extra stuff. All right, so we wanted the derivative, so let's find the derivative. It becomes 1, 2 comes down, cancels, so minus 3x plus 9x squared minus 27 x cubed. And actually, this pattern is very easy, isn't it? 3, 9, 27. You're just multiplying by 3 every time and then switching your signs. So I think the next guy here is going to be 81. That's times another 3, isn't it? 81x to the fourth and so on and so forth. Great. Are we done? Mm, no. Um, it says express f prime as a rational, not a ration, we're not eating anything, as a rational function for the absolute value of x is less than r. Cool. What does that mean? Well, rational functions have the format of something over something, and usually it's a polynomial over a polynomial. Um, well, how do we turn this into a single function? Well, isn't this a geometric power series? I think so. I think each time we multiply by negative 3, right? 1 times negative 3 is negative 3, another negative 3 is 9, so on and so forth, but then also an x x squared, so on and so forth. So we're multiplying by negative 3x every time, which is a common ratio. And this is a, our starting point. And I think we know how to sum up an infinite geometric series as long as it's within a correct ratio, or correct radius. Ratio is fine. Um, and so we do that by doing a, sorry, colors, um, by doing a divided by 1 minus r. And so simplifying further, this becomes 1 over 1 plus 3x. That is a rational function. And this is pretty cool because up here, I might not have known what function that was for. But by looking at the derivative, I now know that this is what the function was for. And in fact, you can even take the antiderivative of this. You'll get a natural log, I think. Um, you can even take the antiderivative to figure out what this was the power series for. Very, very powerful. Next one. Taylor series for something centered around 1, right? We see that center over here is given by all that junk. Find the first three non-zero terms and the general term, uh-oh, general term this time, for the Taylor series of f prime. Easiest way to start, let's start with f. Right? f of x equals, and we're going to start at 1, so we just have a bunch of terms to plug in, unfortunately. Substitute in 1, that becomes a square, so it's going to be positive, negative, positive, negative. Um, 1 over here, maybe I should even write this out, um, like so. So it looks like 2x minus 1 to the first. Okay, there's my first term. Um, then we know positive, negative, so we plug in 2, that becomes 3, that's negative, so we plug in 2, so we're getting 2 squared over 2x minus 1 squared, 2 squared, that's 4, 4 over 2 is 2, x minus 1 squared, okay, then we need to substitute in 3, and I'm going to go for probably 4 of these, um, just in case, so we plug in 3 now, um, substituting in 3, that's positive, so we know we add, um, 2 cubed is 8, and then this is 3, ew, now we get something that's much more gross. So 8 thirds x minus 1 cubed, and yeah, let's do one more of these, let's do 4. So now we're going to be minus, substitute in 4, we get 16 over 4, which is 4, x minus 1 to the 4th, so we get 4, x minus 1 to the 4th, and so on out. Now, they just asked for the general term for f prime, you could find the general term here, but let's try it without the general term and see what happens. So, derivative. Ah, <sighs> here we go. f prime of x. 1 comes down, multiplies by 2, this stays the same to the 0th. Derivative of the inside is 1, so we don't care. Minus 4x minus 1 to the 1st, plus 8x minus 1 squared, 
minus 16x minus 1 cubed. Oh, this is such an easy pattern. Look at that. That turned into something really nice, and I was a little bit worried here. General term, we're alternating in sign. Okay. Um, and it looks like we we're positive at the beginning, so that should be fine. And then what's happening with the number out front? It looks like it's multiples of 2. And x minus 1 is constant and to the n power, starts at 0. So let's double check this. If we substitute 0 in here, do we get 2? No, we don't. We get 1. I bet we need to increase this by 1. Now if you substitute in 0, you get 2. Substitute in 1, you get 4. Yeah, we're looking pretty darn good. Yeah, really, really good, I think, actually. That's awesome. Okay, are we done? Well, we definitely finished A. Now we're on to B. Taylor series is a geometric series. Oh, it is geometric, isn't it? That's so exciting. Let's figure out how it's geometric. Um, it looks to me to get from one term to another, you multiply by negative 2, and then an extra x minus 1. So I think that is our r. Okay, it looks pretty good. Um, and then what about um, a? Well, a is this first term, but be careful, because x minus 1 to the 0th is really just 1. So I think my first term is just 2. Okay, so find the function f prime to which the series converges. So f prime of x is the sum, the convergence of the series, which is a over 1 minus r, like so. Cleaning this up slightly, um, we get 1 minus, and then r is negative 2x plus 2. I think we have a bit of distribution to do here. So it becomes 1 plus 2x minus 2 which really becomes 2x minus 1. Ooh. And then we have to determine f. All right, what was f? Well, f is the antiderivative of this. So we know that if we do the antiderivative of f prime of x, it will tell us what f is. So I need to do the antiderivative of 2 divided by 2x minus 1 dx. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm actually going to leave this the same. I see this is natural log right now. Um, so we know that f of x, right, if you strip away all those non-dominant terms, just look at this, it's 1 over x. So let's just try our luck. Is it the natural log of 2x minus 1? Well, let's see what the derivative of that is. The derivative of that becomes 1 over what's inside times the derivative of what's inside. Yeah, that actually matches. Woohoo! We got super lucky here. That's really nice. Um, if it didn't match, you would have just played around with different constants in the front. And speaking of constants, don't we need a plus c? We do. It's indefinite here, um, so we need this plus c. So going full circle, we found that this is what this Taylor series was based on. Using that Taylor series, we found the derivative, found the sum, and then worked back. So we have both the original function and original derivative and the power series for each. Your review for today actually strays away a bit from what we just did, and it's actually a general review from the last few days. It's always good to touch base on what we've done before. Um, and in fact, the, I think, only problem that you guys will have here that's similar to the one we just did is number 8, where it has you take the antiderivative of sine of t to the 6th, which previously to this lesson was not doable. I wouldn't know how to do the antiderivative of sine of t to the sixth. Um, but you will figure out a way using power series. As always, my work is on Teams. Feel free to check it. We have one more lesson, the dreaded Lagrange error bound. Um, it's going to take us back to that alternating series error bound. We'll compare those two. And then you're done for the semester, guys. I mean, not done, done. You still have some tests and whatnot, but you're done learning, which is very cool. Excited to have you back next class, and good luck.